Good evening. I'm Malcolm McNair of the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, and uh, I'm going to present to you tonight Egbert John Kuchenberg, who is from Holland. Uh, Egbert John Kuchenberg. Um, Egbert uh, graduated from the University of Delft, or Delft University, in 1973. Worked as an architect uh, for various firms in Holland. He's presently studying for the PhD at the University of Delft and studying urban design at Harvard University. Uh, after he leaves here tonight, he'll be going to San Francisco to study uh, for a few weeks with Christopher Alexander. Uh, I can't say much more than that, except that he's been brought to us tonight through the efforts of Martin Rosamond and uh, Harriet Egging. Egging? Okay, I got the name almost right. Uh, he'll be speaking about Dutch towns, uh, development, particularly in the period from 1900 to 1940. And uh, other than that, I, I uh, can't say much more than I've had a delightful afternoon with Egbert, and I think that'll carry over and you'll have some understanding of the reason why. Uh, along with being an architect, as you recall in the uh, material that was circulated in the college, our guest tonight is also a musician, uh, cellist. Uh, he'll be playing tonight, uh, sort of a mini concert, as we have tea and cookies and coffee and so on, sort of a small party. Uh, for architects and music lovers. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Egbert, uh, Jan Kuchenberg. Okay? This is the Dutch flag, by the way. Ten times more people per square mile 
That is to say, thousand feet first by the square mile. And of course, this may be a water you see on the right piece of the landscape, and it's not so uh, unusual at all. Um, because of the water, Holland is a country of cooperation. 30% of the land is below sea level. And really, I can assure you, it takes a lot of work, and it has been taken that since the 16th century, when we started making coal to keep the, the country dry. Maybe that's kind of a uh, source of reason why the Dutch like cooperating. Um, and although it is so densely built up, it, it's pretty nice. It's an entry, one big park, and here there is it's almost even the, the Disneyland. So, yeah, funny. And also, of course, we have Amsterdam, what most of you might may know actually better than the rest of the country. God made the world, but the Dutch made home. And also another night might, might be the Dutch national slogan, what is of all languages in French, because we were French in it sometimes. Germain tiendrai, what means I will sustain. And indeed the Dutch are somewhat stubborn, almost arrogant. We think in Holland is everything better. And sometimes I actually think it is true. <laughs> and uh, a little bit that is of our past, and that's maybe not quite honest. We had a nice past, and we can boast on that. We had our golden age. We were rulers of the waves before Britain. We found a new Amsterdam, and unfortunately sold it again to the, to the, to the Britons, and exchanged it for Dutch Guinea. That was a very stupid action. Otherwise, New York would still have been New Amsterdam. And the 17th century was our golden age. We had Rembrandt, and we had the real goal of the Dutch East in its copies. But we were Calvinistic too, and that gave us a strong power because we were taught together. We built the town hall in Amsterdam in 1648, and we could have built it with gold, even in the size it's now. And there were plans proposed to make it ten times as, as big, but the government of Amsterdam said, no, this is a, not a church, this is a, a building for the public, and it should be modest should be a, a symbol of our will to work and to be simple at the same time. And you see the houses on the canal plants that are indeed very rich in detail, but they are small and they are fitting together in a row. They're not ostentatious. In which a small country country can be great, as again Churchill said about Holland. Okay, this is enough I think about Holland in, in the general sense. One more thing nowadays is that we indeed are still merchants. We have uh, three of the ten largest companies in the world, namely uh, Shell, Philips, and Unilever. We don't have them completely, but we have more than half of the shares. And Rotterdam is still the largest seaport in the world. In the meantime, you may have seen that Holland is there in the middle. This lecture will be very general, as I said already, because I don't know what you know about Holland, and that's really not about the design of Holland, so I give you general. Image. And as I read in Fanelli, who wrote a book on Dutch architects, not so bad, because he says, in discussing the history of modern architecture in Holland, the individually important works cannot be considered separately. Rather, they must be viewed in the context of an architectural and town planning culture, infused to such an extent as perhaps not to be found in any other country in the world. In the landscape, the architecture goes very well with the, with nature in general. We have farmhouses and we have the mansions, the, the, mansion, the old tower houses. And we have the windmill. And you see how also the town used to be actually one big building. You can see on the right side is Nyland on an image of 1674. And you see the one little pearl in the landscape. It was put in the landscape the same way as when one building. There was no sprawl, no nothing like that. And one of my ancestors in the 14th century used to be mayor of such a city. And uh, by the way, he was also bartender. So when the meeting didn't go too well in his viewpoint, he would invite all the elements to his bar and then everything would be all right. He was quite a dictator. <laughs> but um, I read in one of the books about that city that people not living in the town and 
also people that were not farmers. Farmers, of course, lived in the countryside and had their farms there, of course. Cool. But just citizens that were not actually part of the town were with this name called grass burgers. Something like a man not living in the city and not a farmer that couldn't be anything. So it is pretty sad for America because that's mainly a country of grass burgers in that respect. So you'll see that all the extensions that have been made in the period that we are going to see are extensions to keep that, that city one big hole, one big building to keep it closed. And while I'm showing slides, I'm now quoting an architect of the beginning of the century, Kohlhaut, in describing these. The room and silhouette of a town or village always provided the experience of a picturesque intimacy. One saw a pure transition from the rural landscape into the wide, circling, rustling, low outskirts, becoming tighter toward, toward the core, leading rhythmically to a higher plan, and finding its coronation in the climax of the highest buildings of the innermost circle. In the cities, the moats and the canals usually closed the town. In the villages, though, the outer world houses tried, as it were, with their hedges, lodges, and cots of all sorts to approach the level of the meadows and finally this whole area. Old towns and villages are, therefore, monuments of special value. The houses, trees, churches, and town halls, everything has grown together in a welcoming, inviting, warm, cozy hole, and thus, walking through these charming streets, squares, and canals, one can hardly avoid the insistent wish, oh, that this place might remain untouched for a long, long time. And such a wish doesn't well without reason. Here and there we see a crude intervention by the village carpenter or collector, who, following dubious urban examples, erected a stylish shop front on the spot where formerly a simple, stern building had contributed its modest part to the surrounding beauty. It's really the style of the beginning of the century, but that might add to the, to the atmosphere of it. You see how the water punches into the city and there are walls in the middle of the, of the town. And there you see the same how, how the city faces the water that is created. And there are all the nice items that you see in the town. <coughs> I would like to show you one typical example of a city of uh, average size originally in Emidam, where I lived myself. This is a map of 1675 by John Blau. And on the right you see the famous painting by Johannes von Meer, who was from Bell. Actually his house is right next to my house. And uh, well you can see how it's a one big building. This is the eastern gate. And there you see the house boat and everything together is very pictures Oh, there are smaller alleys. We are now walking towards the core of the city, the market square. And there it is. On the left, you have the new church, which is from the 13th century. And on the right, the old church, which is only 20 years old. And we call it the Tower of Pisa of Dell because it's almost the same as Pisa. And here you see the view from the top. And uh, because I had so many slides already, I didn't bring slides of Chicago from the Sears Tower, but I have them in the slides of some of the This urban fabric. And then you see the market busy. And it's not so very different from the time in the 13th or 14th or 15th century. Here you'll see a painting by Peter Brueckel in the 16th century. And on the right you see the kind of children's event. It's not the same, of course, but I mean, many of the colors of the of that life still exist. <coughs> you can have fun with the poles of the old cattle market. Sometimes tourists think that they can walk over the duck weed. This is not this very exceptional when the canal is so covered in weed. And you can always have fun along the canal, fishing and a boat. You see how the houses are little, yeah, little personalities along the canal. They sat there for centuries. But as an, old, as an old tradition, they have big windows. And that's maybe because we have so much fog and so much cloud already that we like. But we still like both lines in the interior. And we again go to Vermeer because he has painted it so beautifully. This is the house of Vermeer. And there you see the interior. See how 
a different shadow they can really adjust the life to their own wish. Playing with life is a touch quality. I can recommend to read uh, uh, Rasmussen's book on that. I think I've pushed one button already. I should go back. This happens to be my room and my house. You see, it's still the same tradition of big window. And now I have one more example in this row that's the biggest of all. Although Amsterdam was not the biggest city in the 50th century, but it became later when they extended it in 1648. With these gigantic canals with their houses along it, they are 200 feet wide. But the most interesting is that they have such enormous allotments in the back. They have been filled in, but some of them are still left over. And you see that even Amsterdam, what is it? Well, it's, it's our capital, it's a big metropolis. It's quite many things are going on there, but it's still as picturesque as one of those smaller towns. You see an old prison. This is a long canal where the house goes up, the little gardens made by the people who live in it. There you see the, the venting on the canal. Sometimes it is where two houses meet each other, but in the case on the right, you see that the house is right on that spot. This is designed by the cable. On the left, you see a house with a little bit tired of standing there with these supports. And there are always funny things to be seen. Like Amsterdam. That is when Amsterdam celebrated the 700th birthday. But now I've shown you the better part. That of course, there were also parts that are not as sure as these. And they were mainly built in the 19th century when also Holland got some bits of an industrial re revolution. And here you see already in the 17th century how the old uh, wide allotments behind the houses got filled in with little laborers' houses. And therefore the town got literally filled in. And on the right, you see what kind of results there is. This is in Rotterdam. And most people don't realize that Holland had bad houses like that. And you see here, uh, on the right, uh, the basement dwelling. And Amsterdam had about 10,000 of these basement dwellings around the turn of the century, where about 30,000 people lived very small, bad cupboard. It was a very poor situation. And also aesthetically it was pretty poor. And the same architect, as I quoted already, said, the beautiful, completed outside aspect of the large as well as the small municipalities is often brutally damaged by the extension. What a fury everywhere of unbridled breakaways. Gone at once was the beautiful intimacy of these cities. One could see the prismatic blocks of the dubious neighborhoods as gaping monsters threatening and beauty devouring, invading the meadows after having broadcast their arrival in a wide circle through a pollution with uncooked things such as only a large town can vomit. This is about those 19th century extensions. And here you see what Amsterdam built. You see the very inner core. You see the ring of canals from the 17th century. And then you see all those blocks with pretty small streets, very thin blocks on them of the 19th century, and on the right you see what kind of image it had, and it was indeed pretty dreary and, and not stimulated in Dutch culture. It was again, it was speculated building. As a matter of fact, nowadays these neighborhoods aren't even that bad compared to the real modern one of high rise, and they can have a new popularity. And especially the larger streets can have kind of colorful livability. It's not even that bad. Some places have uh, <coughs> squares and uh, markets. But generally they are worse than what Holland used to build. And therefore a couple of architects started to realize that, but also the government. By the way, wealthy people always get their things done as they like it. And here you see on the left, the 19th century mall built in Utrecht was really not there to live in. On the right you see castle that was built in the 19th century. But the cities where all the laborers were, were and lived were bad at that time. 
but it's where we start our search, and we are now about 1900. And then the Dutch government um, created the Housing Act, and it was one of the first countries to do so. And this Housing Act, here I am, had three major goals. First, that each town of 10,000 or more inhabitants was obliged to make a professionally designed extension plan, and it was submitted to various uh, uh, rules and regulations for living standards. Secondly, constructions for the use of people of small income were encouraged, and therefore financial aid was available, a substantial amount of subsidy, but also help in loans. And the third thing was the installation of commissions of beauty, and those were commissions of architects who control each piece of architecture for the city, for each design, each new design has to be uh, judged by these rules. And, uh, fairly fitting in, the, in this general image, to get a unified urban design. And here you see how the architects in those times time, uh, were studying the, the old Dutch tradition to find again what those principles were. And on the right you see a drawing by Berlach, and on the left you see Berlach himself, called by Mr. Eaton from an hour. Solomon Richardson of Holland wrote in one person, he would be the, the Dogen, or Dogen, or the Dogen, or the Dogen, or the Dogen, or the was the prime man of the design in that period. And he already in 1892, when he had read a famous book by Zita, Town Planning According, Artistic Principles, said things like, there should be a unity of architecture and urban design. Unresponsible remains the acceptance of such plans as Amsterdam does, which deal even not in the slightest way with the demands of monumentality and picturesqueness. The town is a designed space to be beautiful, and as a wrapping of a social structure. Town planning is a three-dimensional task. Squares have to be dressed for a party, as pride and joy of the citizens, and the continuous culturing of great noble feelings for the youth, as it was in the old time. By us not the gigantic measures, though, and therefore no broad boulevards. By us a certain art tradition of the picturesque Holland. And the means of power, he considered, was the property line. Because an urban designer has actually, as, as the property line, he, he, he holds the, the shape of the city. So he said, architects who are going to fill in these plans honor the property lines in order that thou shalt build properly and your practice will be a long one on this road. But he was not an urban designer, because urban design was not a profession as such in those times. And therefore, he looked abroad, and he studied all the foreign studies of those days. And by 91, Amsterdam looked like this on the left. You see the core again, and all the 19th century extensions. And when Bernard died in 1934, Amsterdam was as it is on the right. The enormous amount of dwellings and neighborhoods have been added, and how this was done comes now. And on the right you see then the Dutch people who carried it out, and on the left you see the most important uh, authority on urban design in foreign countries. And the amazing thing is that. The amount of books published in foreign countries is about the same as the amount of city extension as we did in Holland. In foreign countries, it was not carried out. In Holland, we didn't publish anything. We didn't study. We didn't write what we built. And that may be the nice thing of Holland. And that's because of that collaboration and because of the Housing Act that really made possible to, to implement. Uh, I'm not going to dive into the uh, specific works of these people because of lectures to tell, you might recognize most names, and they have said really very interesting things. Actually, the whole theory of Dutch towns you can find in these works, but they have never been carried out in their own country. 
and on the right you see names that I might use from time to time. A few slides of them. For example, you see also how they in Germany, for instance, try to get rid of that squareness of those dreary, gaping, prismatic monsters, as I said before, to make it more subtle, more fluid, and more pouring the landscape. You see it on the left, on the left. And on the right, you see an example of such plan, where streets follow the, yeah, the landscape and retain the sense of place and, and the site. Here you see who Carl Henrique, one of those theorists, um, explained how you can bend blocks and still have square corners because the net and this cube core is very hard to build. And on the right, he talks about the aesthetical uh, thrill that you get in a bent street. And it was all red in Holland, it was all of On the left, you see by unwind called a modern entrance to a suburb. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Compared to the dreariness of the 19th century, it was modern because it was human. On the right, you see the boulevard of Richard and Meyer in Paris. It had also some entrance, as you might see later. On the left, you see a plan of 1911 by Murray. That was very well known in Holland, this plan, because it showed a nice way to combine kind of large order on the whole and the picturesque inside and all these smaller houses inside. You will see a couple of examples of that. And on the right you see a plan in Germany, uh, Schoenburg, Berlin, that's very similar to the Amsterdam South plan that we're going to see now. The plan on the left is 1903, done by Ben. And it was actually almost a copy of the theory of Zieker. Zieker was the man of that group that I mentioned before, Marxist principles. And there was almost no order. I think everybody would get lost in that plan. It's quite a mess of picturesque. And fortunately, the Dutch government, the, the Manchester in Amsterdam, didn't accept the plan. They rejected it as being non Dutch, being overdone in picturesque. And the plan on the right was adopted and carried out. That was 1970. And there you see how there has come up, has resulted a kind of blend of the influence of Paris and also of America. Because Berlach visited America in 1911 and saw uh, Con Ave in Boston, saw Chicago with all its ground straight to the park. Um, and that romantic, aesthetical, of the Germans and the English. And I think Holland is pretty unique in that it combined these two elements. You see in the broad boulevard, broad straight streets, the walls as a whole, but in the, in, the, in the detail, in the little corners of the neighborhood, you will find a picturesqueness as we have built always, as we have built in, in the Middle East. Middle East. So what I've got to do now is showing you parts of this plan, first general image. First, I view that Berla did of the 1970s plan. I think this is the most important plan of the Dutch government design, and it really yeah, covered most of the, of the work, but it, and also it, it stimulated the work elsewhere in Holland. And here you see how it was uh, actually uh, carried out. It was subdivided into so called groups, and these groups were carried out by housing corporations, or by the municipalities, or by private buildings. But each of those three groups will get one group, and it will take one architect who will carry it out, of course, under the rules that I explained before. So, therefore, that whole extension was, was pretty large, a couple of miles long, retained the unity because it was a master plan by Bella, but has, has also local uh, individuality. And it might be nice now to call Bella one more time. There was namely an important conference of normalization make all part of buildings, windows, doors, uh, etc., standard to get a kind of unity. And what we were against, Bella was very much in favor of it. And he said somewhere, he, he could ventilate his, his social ideas. And the social meaning of dwellings of the same type is that they presuppose a common, what's 
treatment the comparable social equality of their residents. The modern town planning should strive for individualizing the townscape, not the single dwelling, not the latter, but a rhythmical combination of houses. The block faces form the space element for the modern art of town building, or as the laborer finally still stuck to the individual dwelling. It is true the Dutchman is an obnoxious individualist, and I presume the Dutch laborer is not an exception in that. But we hope that it could become better, that you indeed could dwell as 200 families in one nice block, one palace from laborers, as you call it. We'll see that some of those things have, have been carried out. I call one more time the other architect who says about the plan, and then we are going to see a film because I have quite many slides I'm going very quickly through them. Not till now has a new ring been built. Far from the core of the old town, it's true, which can fortunately be called the ring of revival, of relief. Its promising new architecture will complete it with dwellings and buildings, which, as in the days of yore, will make the city beautiful inside as well as out. And then he comes with the kind of social theory that's interesting. We realize that where formerly town life depended upon its central market square and then of each village upon its village green on common, we now need this centeredness only for administrative facilities. One is a citizen of Holland and is haphazardly in A or B. While formerly one was a citizen of, of A or B, and therefore a Dutchman, the city of today comprises a series of quite different images. The image of the large city and that of the small city combined with the image of the rural village and that of the desperate prismatic blocks of the between as they all grow into another. He is referring again to the 19th century sense, but also to the, to the garden city idea, what was rejected in Holland because we didn't believe in a new town. We always wanted to be, uh, yeah, uh, we wanted to, to rely on the old center because they were good. We only believed in extension of those. Our task is to create, by destruction and construction, new harmonies and shaped mediators which will connect all the new things. It is necessary, therefore, to get to a new form of beauty by way of the larger conception and to provide a new open character of cities with a specific aesthetic quality without being held to the idea of the old closed town image. Two powerful factors are now there to enable the great new construction. One, the new consciousness of the architect of our time. Second, the real necessity of mass housing and a governmental help in that. Fortunately, the people who are able to enrich our towns and country with new architectural beauty are among us. Seeing the ugly things that were made so shortly before them, the architectural kids could stubbornly forward and behold, they created a new architectural idea. The avoidance of this first building, the general conception of grouping, has already given rise to the origin of town and village extension to which when touched after some years by the powerful rush of power time, will adapt themselves totally to their environments. Let's see what it is. I'm glad to see how it's carried out, almost exactly as the plan was sort of unique for such a large part. This is the ordering space, the large element, the church building. You see in the facade already there is a kind of tiny detail. And these are all apartments with the central entrance on the street. See what a nice image these uh, blocks have with shops along the street. And you see that instance of the drawing that I showed you. And also, of course, of the medieval cities with the street way. There's a big block outside, and then you go through such like archway, and inside you'll find a smaller street. And to actually to make something for everybody, for the state. The density of these neighborhoods is pretty high, about uh, 60 to 70 dwellings per acre. It's a very nice detail, brick and color. That wag is uh, modern. It used to be in colors like uh, red, and green, and brown, and purple, like the bricks on the left. Okay, what's that? Well, doesn't matter. There it is. You 
see how canals were made back in the country centre. Beautiful details in its walls, the walls of the spaces. It's space architecture. And the architecture of the houses is the architecture of the wall of that space. The dwellings behind are very simple, and the backs of the houses are usually also very simple. It has been criticized as wall architecture, facade architecture. I think this could be so. Funny corners, man art way. Very colorful. Houses these are for the more uh, wealthy people. But they are just part of the whole extension. They are in between cheaper part and actually there's not such a wide range of rent. Now we're going to see a couple of special projects. This was one in nineteen fifty. It's really built in the past, so you can see it from the outside. It's almost a self-contained village. But again, lower houses inside. Although there's an individuality of the dwelling unit, it's still a big hole with those towers to celebrate the block. An exceedingly beautiful thing in that is the Eisenhower, meaning old stove, has stayed by the clerk in 1970. You can see it, it's, well, it's hard to point it out. You'll see it from the other picture. Here you see a colored drawing of the plan. And here you see, see how it has a tower. It's not a church, but it's just a tower to celebrate the existence of this palace of labor. Very nice details. This was, of course, very expensive, but one of the elements of Amsterdam said, well, we have to build it. It's art for the laborer, and nothing is too expensive for that. And it's also a gesture for the future. Let's do it. And then they would raise money made from colonial wealth. And anyway, we use the money properly. And it's noted that one of the women living in such in this building said, or wrote down when the architect died some time. He is dead, the man of our houses. How can we, laborers' wives, go by way this is the inside? It's like a little village. Laborers' wives, honor this man, this tough worker, for what he has done for our men and children. It's, isn't it lovely to come home after a day of tiresome work in such a house, which is built up from pure delight and home happiness? Isn't it as if each, each brick sings, come all ye laborers and recreate in your house? that's made especially for you. That's the, the paternalistic. Isn't the Sparendammer Burt, the Sparendammer neighborhood that's where this building is, a fairy tale of which you have been dreaming as a child because it is something that just didn't exist when we were young? So you see, it was very much liked by the, by the people living in it. And although they realized that their dwellings were a little bit smaller because of all the details in the architecture, they felt like living in the street. It was kind of they lived in the street because that street was sculptured as a, as a building. And you see an example where also the inside of the block was given shape as a communal garden. This is an old picture because nowadays it's subdivided into private gardens. The kind of communality doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. It's by the same architect, by the way. And a few other examples of these communal gardens. Another example of Pete Kramer, also in the same neighborhood. Again, you see what kind of fantastic detail. So you imagine this door serves about three to four apartments. We call them portique flats. And this is also a very fantastic thing. It's called the Dagera Dome. By Pete and the other man that I mentioned to Claire. Very uh, organic architect, almost an orgy of brick. Very nice street shape, though. And here we have such an example again, a beautiful one of a castle with small dwellings inside. This is by Berlage, and you see what what work was done for for the elevation. And you have to realize this is all social housing, it's not banking. Jewish company or museum, just housing. We 
we walk inside, see a lot of black people that are here from Dutch uh, Guinea coming to Holland. And uh, these houses still have very low rent. Used to be a communal garden there. I'm using old pictures because now it looks a little bit. It's a, a no flower. But also you have to go to the curtain of the kitchen. Here's another one by Tom Aiken. I think it's a nice one. It's very simple indeed, but still it has that flavor that we are talking about. You see a detail of the rain, the French. We are still in Amsterdam. We will leave Amsterdam too for a while. The fancy detail. There must be a nice room upstairs there. I tried to get in there, but people were at home. It's all the same neighborhood. And this is a little bit modern, more modern part. It's in the late uh, 20s, early 30s, uh, Amsterdam West. And there you see a square on the right called the Mercator Square. And we will have a few slides of this. This is drawn by Berlapel Square. I don't have an image of that square because I lost my film slide. The square was in there. But you get an image of the architect. It has become a little bit small simply because the money was not as available as now. Had been. But still, same principle. Now we go to the more outskirts of Amsterdam, where you have a smaller scale, a little bit lower money, a little bit closer to the garden city idea, although not in principle because it was part of Amsterdam. The garden city is itself contained in this urban town. And there are very, very nice plans. Here you see the famous focal point. We believe that you should be a church or so, but this neighborhood apparently didn't need a church. This is an electric uh, power station. And it's got the same, you know, aesthetically, the architects wanted a thing like that. You see again, form and wall. This architecture wall and space. A three-dimensional urban design. This is really kind of outdoor room. This is another small thing. You see how they match the old architecture. On the right, this is called Neiman Dam, as you can see. It means a few dike. See, on the bottom is an old street built, a long street, and how it was extended. It's still part of Amsterdam because this was incorporated in another study. You see again how the architect has been working to, to keep that central place. And again, he also introduces an archway because it was also enhanced the device. Oh, sorry. On the left, we see the central square in the center. On the right is another part of Amsterdam where they use um, plaster to make it looking like concrete because it was modeled in those days. But that's just the material, that's really not because the principles of the, of the urban design are exactly the same. I'll show you some parts of Rotterdam that have the same. First, I view people really spend a lot of time in making drawings to show how it has to be. You see how, how elegantly the plan fits in the old fabric. This is the building up of an old estate in the middle of the city. You see again how there are larger streets, smaller streets, little squares, uh, stressed corner buildings. Block and court. And it's a pretty famous block. It's a little bit different because it has not the central door on the street, but a kind of a lifted gallery to get to the measurements on the third floor. And it was such a pretty modern thing in 1990, done by Brickman. And it's very famous for architects because it's such a, an item. But in the neighborhood, generally, it's not like 
but like usually traditional things better in all of the games. It looks also pretty much hard outside. There are features like the art you get. But inside it's quite funny. People much rather live on the on the third floor and have their front door on the street and then they have to walk on the hand of balcony. It doesn't have anything like the street. The street culture is sort of important. And this is maybe one of the nicest examples of the garden city life in France that I really would like to show you. That's Breiweg in Rotterdam. And to compare it with English examples, which could stand for also French and European examples, I show you for a sunlight on the right, and you see it's much denser. The density is about three times as high. Because in Holland we believe that the higher density would be not only better for the life within such neighborhoods, for the uh, amenities, for the shops, for the, uh, the public transportation, but also for Holland in a very small country built density anyway. But the nice thing about this neighborhood that it is, although it's very dense, it is still enjoyable. It's a very, very nice environment. Now again, the eternal, maybe almost boring for you, uh, canal. But now we see many, many places at one time. And people who live here, for them there's only one canal. So why should we build many, many I can't see why people could build additional. At the end of the lecture, you'll see some high-rise buildings that there's really no any sense in it. These high-rises have, have lost completely all contact with, with the people and with the society they were meant for. And although this was built by a man who was later considered as fascist because he was so traditional, he's now very much alive again because we, we now understand his approach and we understand now that he was building for the people. And indeed, this neighborhood was now uh, 60 years old, is one of the most popular in Holland, and the most new uh, revolutionary extensions are or refused. You see square, little store on the corner, and also economically, these stores can see the work get because people don't mind having a small store and having not a big turnover because so much overhead costs can be skipped. It works. So the hot baker, to get warm bread from the bottom, little bars, little taffy, uh, everything works again. Fortunately, here you see a small street with a focal point in the form of the church, and here you see a kind of full view, we call it Dutch door cage, I don't know what's next to it, towards the allotments in the rear, you have communal gardens. And although people have small gardens themselves, not, not the ideal one acre as it is in America, only a few square meters, as a matter of fact, they have the communal property. And in some modern examples, there are tennis courts. Here it's just, uh, here you see some track cars. And during the time of erection of these neighborhoods, there were uh, competitions who had the most beautiful gardens. So you can see, got inspired by them. Another example now, more in the eastern part of Holland, in Enschede, that's a very different. Pronounced. Uh, we see this extension of uh, architecture maps called Popos. And although it's a little less than it's more English influence, it has still a kind of continuously built of, uh, rows of houses and long spaces. Here on the right, you see the common. It means a couple of the plan. You see again on the plan all those little squares. Not too much as we call play areas, play grounds. Again, the core popularity of the windmill. Another square, with just red tiles on the roofs, an archway. It's all it's simple, simple things. It's very simple. Small street. See how nice you can extend your house and stuff. And this kind of architecture, it enhances the beauty. It gives it makes it human, it makes it yeah. live in, but not in a poor way. Not slummy. Here's another one at Lansing, near Hengelo, industrial village originally, but of course built under the same conditions as municipal or 
housing corporation building. Housing corporation where the yeah, unions of the laborers can erect houses for themselves. A nice mall. And a kind of Hofje is all on the copy of the 17th century Hofje core where the Alan people live. Now I'll show you almost as the last feature of this kind of traditional city exception, the Haag, or the Hague, the Haag in Dutch anyway, what actually means the, the court of the, of the count, because the count lived here in the 16th century, and all the government uh, resides here. This extension plan is done by Berlach in 1908, and although it's less known and maybe less impressive, I think it's the best example of the Dutch town idea because it has really that flavor of being, yeah, being very, very much human, just being streets, squares, etc., and houses for people. Nothing pretentious. Not that, that, that overwhelming architecture of Amsterdam, but, and also not a kind of, it's not rural, it's not, not city like, it's kind of blend of everything. And it's a very popular city to live in because it, it's not too dense, it's not. You have all the amenities of the city, but still, it's, yeah, it's enough green. You see a couple of drawings that Verlag added to his plan. Those were a little bit overdone, I think, and they have not been carried out. But you see the ID, the squares, the couple of people dressed for parties. And on the right, you see how part of the extension plan was structured by broad trees and then cut into groups that were designed by separate architects. You see an image of it, people moving some stuff, corners with shops, little architectural features used as a focal point. Well, besides people themselves. Also, the, you, know, you see the sports field incorporated in the residential fabric. Sculpture wall, street wall, and a bathroom. There you see a church embodied in the fabric of the houses. It's still very nicely dry. <coughs> Here's again such a, a castle with surrounding high buildings and smaller buildings inside with three squares diminishing in, in size. You see the outside and there we walk through the arch. And then you see on the right the largest of the three squares with a lot of play things for children. This is a Done with simple needs to, to give a variety. Not the individual dwelling is, is uh, expressed, but the individuality of the block of the neighborhood. A few more details of these houses. You see the entrance, the, the Haag has a kind of own way of getting upstairs. They don't have the front door on the street, but they go up first, and there they have a couple of other front doors. And typically, then half. Amsterdam will always have the door on the street. You get a little bit of modern influence in this architecture. It's right there. This is a city called Highland. You get smaller. And finally, Delft again. The dark red is the part you have seen in the beginning. And the pink is, or, no, pink, is what is proposed in 1922. But 
could only, unfortunately, partly carried out because later we got the modern movement, what you'll see in the, in the tail of this lecture. But over right, you see the part that has been carried out in that way. Remember that living without discontentment, without a poetry in street, neighborhood and place, will prove a greater danger to the harmonious development of our society than a possibly timely disequilibration of the economy, something which can be repaired more easily than spoiled towns. And actually this has proved to be true because we have built we have had kind of revival of the 19th century to build speculative buildings. Not in the sense uh, that we built it for speculation financially, but it was done on the basis of fast and, and, and many and, and large quantities. It was necessary, of course, after the war, after the Second World War. But many people are now aware of the fact that it had, could have been done at the same speed, in the same quantity, and for the same price, or even cheaper, because high rise actually are pretty expensive. And also with the same density, because they are not as dense as, as low rise can be. It could have been done in the way it used to be done. Or, of course, there's a difference. I mean, we don't live anymore in the beginning of the century. But you, we could have proved it from within, and I think that will be the thesis of my book, finally. But that's, of course, I have another one half here. So on the left you see how many cities in Holland have been accepted, and on the right you see the last of the Maori countries, the last plan in the traditional way, uh, the Amsterdam Greater West Plan of 1927 by Mr. Whitley. And now I would like to have the definition of the Dutch town ID. It is a rather dense, concise, continuously built of whole of mainly pedestrian scale, consisting of streets and row house blocks, with a concern for positive outdoor space. That's a term to some extent. Urban, both the treatment of the streets, greens, and houses, formal and grand, in the order of the whole, the irregular, individual, and picturesque on the scale of the block, house, and the detail. I call this the brown environment. That's uh, inspired by the idea that good bars are called brown bars, because of, not only because of the brown, but also because of the, the atmosphere, the brown atmosphere. But how did it come that we didn't build them anymore? First of all, we had interest of architectural theorists like Gideon. And uh, also, of course, of people like the Corbusier. But also in Holland itself, men like Dijkert, Van Bochum, Van Thijen, they proposed schemes like the bottom one. 